Let's continue with the brain by looking at its blood supply. The brain might make somewhere around 4% of a person's body weight, but it often receives somewhere around 20% of all the blood. So that is a huge amount of blood going to that brain, especially those neurons. Those neurons are the most active cells in the body, so they are very big consumers of nutrients no matter what they are. Even a slight interruption for just a few seconds is all it takes for unconsciousness to occur. And if neurons don't receive adequate amounts of oxygen and other nutrients more than about two to four minutes, they'll start to die. And of course, they're not coming back. Again, neurons have a very, very high metabolic rate, more than any other cell type in the body. That means they're gonna have a huge demand for oxygen and glucose. Those are two materials they need a lot of if they're gonna make all the ATP required to keep these cells functioning normally. Now, when you look at how blood gets to the brain, it's through four large arteries. There is a left and right internal carotid artery. And then in the back in the neck, along with the cervical vertebrae, there are vertebral arteries, a left and right of those. So again, those are the four big arteries, left and right internal carotid, left and right vertebral. And those arteries all run together to form one big circle called the cerebral arterial circle, also called the circle of Willis. And off of that circle, many arteries run out to all the different parts of the brain. But where this blood passes through these tiny capillaries in the brain, there is a very special barrier formed by cells called astrocytes, making the blood brain barrier. Better be very careful if you let harmful substances get out of your blood into these neurons, they may die and they will probably never grow back and you will probably lose some vital functions. And even though this is a very good barrier, lipid soluble chemicals can always get through cells and cell membranes. That's what tends to get through them while most of anything else is not. So again, with that blood brain barrier, looking at these astrocytes, they're just epithelial cells. They're lining these capillaries. Again, tight junctions are proteins that bind cells together tightly. So not much anything will get in between the cells, but again, lipid soluble materials can get through them. So water soluble substances generally won't get through here without the cell's permission. But again, lipid soluble tend to pass by diffusion anytime they want. That's how things like nicotine, ethanol, heroin, whatever that is gets to the brain even though these astrocytes don't want them to. But let's look at the cranial nerves next. Now these are nerves coming off of the brain. These were mentioned in a previous video right here. Spinal nerves coming off the spinal cord will be looked at in another video. Now these cranial nerves are 12 pair. So it's 24 total, 12 on the left, 12 on the right. They've been named with proper names we'll look at further along and also with Roman numerals one through 12. Looking at these nerves, they have many different functions. Some of them are just sensory, that may be special or general. Some of them are somatic motor, controlling skeletal muscle. Some of them are parasympathetic, regulating things like glands, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. And some of these nerves are a combination of these functions, making them mixed nerves. But looking at the different cranial nerves briefly and the different functions they have, some of them are just sensory. Nerves one, two, and eight are just sensory. Some of them are just motor. Numbers four, six, 11, and 12 will be motor. Some are motor and sensory. At least one of them is, number five. Some are motor and parasympathetic. The third cranial nerve is. And then some are motor, sensory, and parasympathetic. That would be cranial nerves seven, nine, and 10. We want to look at each one of these nerves here and see what exactly is that they're doing. Sensory, motor, something autonomic, whatever that may be. Now, the first cranial nerve is your olfactory. When you're olfactory, you think sense of smell. And that's exactly what this one is all about. They're located just above the cribriform plate, which is a thin piece of bone right at the top of your nasal cavity. The second cranial nerves are the optic. They are purely your sense of vision, so they're all sensory. The third cranial nerve, the oculomotor, this has several functions. And it's motor to the superior, medial, and inferior rectus muscles of the eye. Remember, those are three of the muscles that move each one of your eyes. Those were covered in another video. They're also motor to the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. 
That's what opens up your eyes when you think about elevating your upper eyelids, which are palpebrae. And they also cause constriction of the pupil. If you get outside where it's bright, you need that pupil to constrict. That way too much light is not coming in. And also the oculomotor has control over the ciliary muscles of the lens. That allows you to focus on objects which are near and far. The fourth cranial nerve, the trochlear, is motored to the superior oblique muscle of the eye. So that's just one of those muscles moving the eye, each one of them there. The fifth cranial nerve is the trigeminal. It has three big branches, the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. And they are sensory from the face. That ophthalmic is largely sensory from your nose and forehead, the maxillary from your upper jaw, and the mandibular from your lower. But this trigeminal nerve also controls the muscles involved with mastication, which are chewing. Those muscles would include the temporalis, the masseter, the lateral and medial pterygoids. The trigeminal is also motor to the soft palate. That's what's in the very rear of your oral cavity. When you swallow food or drink, it flips up. That way that stuff doesn't go back up towards your nose, but can only go down. It's also motor to the throat. That's the pharynx, if you hear it called that. And the tensor tympani muscle in the middle ear. That has to do with protecting the deeper inner structures from very loud noises. Looking at cranial nerve number six, the abducens. This is motor to the lateral rectus eye muscle. So there's another one of those eye muscles there. Moving on to number seven, the facial nerve. This is sensory taste, specifically from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Sensory from some parts of your external ear and your palate. Again, think about hard palates, the roof of your mouth, and soft palates further back where there's skeletal muscle. And you got that uvula dangling off the center of it. It's also motor to muscles of facial expression. So these muscles in your face you use for expression are controlled by this facial nerve. Also, some of the muscles of the throat and the middle ear. It has parasympathetic control over the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. So that's two of your three sets of salivary glands. Also has control over the lacrimal glands, which are your tear glands, and also glands of the nasal cavity and palate. Moving on to cranial nerve number eight, the vestibulocochlear. This is involved with sensation. You're involved with senses of hearing and balance. Moving on to number nine, the glossopharyngeal. This has sense of taste from the posterior third of the tongue. It's sensory from the pharynx, which is your throat, palatine tonsils, posterior third of the tongue, middle ear, and carotid sinus. It's motor to one of the pharyngeal throat muscles and has parasympathetic control of the parotid salivary glands and glands on the posterior third of the tongue. Then we move on to number 10, the vagus nerve. Very big, important nerve here because it is sensory and also has parasympathetic control over just about everything inside your thoracic and abdominal cavity. So when you look at all these internal organs in the trunk of your body, this vagus nerve is sensory and again has parasympathetic control over just about every one of them there. It also has taste from the posterior part of the tongue. It is motor to the soft palate, pharynx, and laryngeal muscles involved with voice production and the extrinsic tongue muscles, which are more about moving the tongue around. Number 11, the accessory nerve is motor to the sternocleidomastoid muscles. You use those when you turn your head left and right, like when you tell somebody no, and also the trapezius muscles, very much involved with moving the scapula. And then lastly, number 12, the hypoglossal is motor to tongue muscles and throat muscles.